Okay, AP packet review number two, day two. And we have, we're going to be discussing the normal model and the probability statement, normal CDF and inverse norm, and a couple other problems that go along with it. All right, but, but before we do that, I'm going to start with yesterday's assignment that I asked you to do. And on this particular assignment, I ask you to describe this distribution. Okay, I've kind of roughly drawn the distribution. I wanted to show you it. It goes from 0 to 25. The frequency goes from 0 to 175. So I've kind of drawn it up here. Um, this goes from 0 to 175. All right, and I've kind of recreated it, this here. And I believe the, let's get the units. This was response time in hours. And this was the frequency. Now, I don't think I let you know what it was talking about. Let's talk about that this is EMT response time in hours. Emergency medical training, anyone like an ambulance. You didn't know that because I didn't give it to you, so you would not include that into your data. But let's go ahead and see. For uh, the acronym I told you we're going to use is CUS. When we have one variable, um, so center, and the first thing I'm going to do is I say, okay, if the mean, if this is a symmetric distribution, then I'm going to do, I'm going to do the mean. If it's a skewed distribution, I'm going to do the median. So for the median, um, so this is definitely skewed because my distribution goes this way. So I'm going to use the median, but I noticed that it is bimodal because I have a mode here and a mode here. So I'm going to talk about this median, the median of the first hump and the median of the second hump. Um, you definitely could talk about that probably the median of both is somewhere around nine because if I were to mark them, which I marked them with X's, you could say, okay, top, bottom, top, bottom, and it probably comes around somewhere around here. But I'm going to say that um, the bimodal distribution of response times, so I'm making sure I'm including my context of the EMT emergency medical team um, has two centers, medians, around five hours and 15 hours. Well, obviously this can't be EMT. I put that it was EMT because that seems absolutely ridiculous. It'd be five hours and 15 hours. So it has to be something else, response time. Maybe that's of, let's say, of a really um, indigenous country or something like that. Okay. Anyway, so we have unusual features. Um, unusual features, do I have any outliers? Do I have any um, gaps? And I don't, so I don't even have to mention it. Um, my shape, I already mentioned that my shape, I talked about that, is going to be skewed towards the larger response times, which I could say to the right. And then my um, spread is going to be, I use median with IQR. So my IQR, remember, is Q3 minus Q1. So that kind of gives me, I say, okay, my Q3 minus Q1, this would be Q1 and this would be Q3. Remember, Q1 is the median of the first half of the data. So I would basically say, okay, this is from here to here. So this is like all this area. The median of that data would give me my Q1 and the median of this data would give you give me my Q3. So I went ahead and did it and it looks like to me I get about three here and about seven here because it's pretty symmetric. So I would do seven minus three is four hours. So that would be one of my IQRs and the other IQR I would do, I went ahead and did it and I got from here, um, actually I got 14 on this one and 16 on this one, just looking at the actual data. And again, it's about, because I don't have the perfect, the perfect, I don't have the data actually even on this tier. I, I don't know where everything is exactly, and I could fill it out, but it looks like to me that's about what it is. Might be a little less than that, and that's two hours. Okay, my range um, of the larger one is going to be, looks from here to here, so it looks like about 10 hours. And the range of the other one is going to be from 10. Was it 10 to 20? Did I get that right? Um, yeah, really, let's say it starts a little bit higher than the 10. It's really more like 12. 
12 to 20, so it's more like 8. This really is should be 12. 10 is more down here. I didn't draw it perfectly. All right, so that's going to be my... Um, and I wanted to make sure BS, it's cuss and BS. BS just means be specific. Just to remind myself, did I talk about the response time? Did I talk about the EMT? What is it talking about? And yes, I did throughout. And as long as I did that throughout what I'm doing, I am, then I'll be completely fine. And make sure you have, and then hours, making sure that these are labeled. Okay? All right, the next part that I ask you to do is I ask you to take these numbers here and ask you to find Q1, Q3, IQR, and outliers. So to do that, I would throw it into my calculator. And I went ahead and did that in my calculator. And I did a one variable statistics to remind you of how to do that. It's menu, stat, calc, one variable statistics, one data, drop down menu. I called mine period one example. And then I'd hit OK. And there's all my data. X bar is my mean. Um, SX is my standard deviation. I always use SX unless I'm unless it specifically asks for sigma, um, or if SX is not available for my standard deviations. And then here's all my data for my mean, median. So my Q1 is 30, and my Q3 is 48. So Q1 is 30, and Q3 is 48. So if you could please show your work. Because if you happen to add those instead of subtract those just because your mind wasn't thinking, as long as you show your work, you won't lose credit. So I want to make sure you get maximum credit for the knowledge you have and minimum, minimum um, points off on mistakes you make. And as for outliers, these outlier formulas will not be on the test, so you do have to memorize those. There's very few things you have to memorize, but this is one of them. So you need to make sure you have this memorized. And so I asked about outliers, and I got from 3 to 75. Obviously, 3 and 75 are outside my data, so no outliers. And if I ask for outliers, you're going to have to show work. Okay, alternate 2. You could show that you have um, outliers or no outliers if, and if I didn't have this data. Like, what if I didn't have access to Q1 Q, and Q3, and instead I had access to my mean and standard deviation? Well, my mean um, was, I think, 12.5. Let me double check. My mean was, no, my standard deviation was 12.5, and my mean was 42.1. So my mean was 42.1, and my standard deviation was 12.5. So using um, that if it's above or below by two standard deviations, that's what we consider unusual. Let's review why do I consider that unusual. Um, because remember on my 68, 95, 99, 7 curve, 68 percent, 95 percent. All right, 95 percent is one, two segregations. And what have we been using all year for reject ho? Five percent. Five percent is my typical. And so obviously this area out here is a total of five percent. So 95%, anything we see outside of two standard deviations, we do consider unusual. So if you did not do it like this, you could also use the standard deviation. Or if uh, Q1 and Q3 were not available, you would use the standard deviation. So I'm just going to find my X bar, which is 42.16 times two standard deviations. And I get 67.16 for the upper and 17.16 for the lower. Again, well, they're different, but that's okay. Because you found this is just giving us a benchmark. You guys are learning that there is an outlier rule. And eventually, when you, when you go into practice, you would actually say, um, you would know which one to use and why and, and for different reasons. Um, but I do want to show you, what if this value was, let's say, 70, okay? The person that did the outlier rule with Q1, Q3 would say there are no outliers. But the person that did these outliers would say that there are outliers. And that's okay as long as you show your work and you have your rationale. You also could use three standard deviations. That would be fine. But we typically use two standard deviations, and you're always safe using two. As long as you show your work and you have your rationale, you'll be fine. All right. So I'm going to jump back now to go ahead and go to our packet. So if you guys could open the packet, I believe we're at like the top of page two. And let me go ahead and bring it up here. So this is all the stuff we did yesterday, and so we're up here. All right, so we're going to do the normal curve, and we're just going to get a couple reminders. Remember that the area under the normal curve is 1, and that means what that means is just basically that the entire area is shaded. It is a density curve, and the area under a density curve is 1. But that just means multiply that by 100, and what, you, what do you get? You get 100%. That just means the entire curve is shaded. It's 100%. 
All right, uh, for a normal curve, a standard, if this was my normal curve, let's go ahead and draw it above here. The normal curve, the mean is zero and standard deviation is one. And that's just normalizing things so that we can compare them. In fact, we're going to be comparing them here in a moment, right? If I compared your SAT scores and your ACT scores, it, I can't do it on a numerical measure because they have different numerical scales, but I definitely could do it as far as Z-scores. And these here are Z-scores. All right, and that's my mean, and that's my standard deviation. Okay, and the rule that describes one, two, three standard deviations for the mean, we already talked about that, but 68, 95, 99, 7 rule, and what that means is 68% of my data is within one standard deviation of my mean, so 68% of the people lie in this category. 95% of my data is within two standard deviations of the mean, and 99% of my data is within three standard deviations of the mean. That's what that means. Okay, let's look at example two. Students at a fine arts academy view on average five movies per semester. So that's my mean with a standard deviation of two movies, and that's my standard deviation. What proportion of students view more than six movies. So I'm looking for x greater than six per semester. All right, step one is to draw a picture, draw a picture, draw a picture, right? And I'm going to put n five comma two. I'm going to label all of these nicely. Five, seven, nine, eleven, three, one, and negative one. And you may say negative one it's, I can't watch negative one movies. I understand models are, are an ideal for us. They're not always useful, so it's just a model, so don't worry about if you have uh, inappropriate values. Okay, and then I'm just going to put number of movies. Now, once you have a nice model drawn, you don't have to draw in detail all the way through on all these questions since they have to do with it. So I would just draw a model here, and I would draw anything that's, a pro, um, anything that's pertinent to mine. And so more than six, I would go ahead at least to seven, because I, I six is in between um, five and seven, so this is the mo this is the picture I would draw because I'm looking for this percent, and it clearly shows me that I know that it's going to be less than sixteen uh, percent. How do I know that? Because let's look at our model. Remember, sixty eight percent is in between, so that means sixteen percent is on left and right. So since six is to the left, and then Obviously, smack dab in the middle is always 50%. So I know my answer is going to be somewhere between 16 and 50%. So that kind of gives me an idea. And if I'm doing a multiple choice, it gives me a good idea of what the answer is going to be. Okay, so recall, I'm going to have to write out my probability statement. I kind of had it for you on your um, on the, the sheet here that I have. So the probability statement is going to be x. I'm looking for is greater than 6. But that's the same thing as now I'm standardizing it. And remember, my z-score is observed minus mean divided by standard deviation. So it's going to be greater than observed, six movies, and observing six movies minus and five is my mean divided by two. You're welcome to go ahead and continue to do this. I put a blank here and go ahead and jump to technology. If you want to do everything else by hand, make sure you show your work and do everything else by hand. But I do normal CDF, lower bound. I say, okay, lower bound here, guys, if you remember, is the lowest that my curve is shaded. And so I'm going to put 6, upper bound. And that's the highest area that my curve is shaded. And so my curve is shaded all the way to the end. So I want to make sure that I get something that's off the chart. So I always put infinity because infinity is always off the chart. So your calculators don't do infinity. So I put 99999. Unless you have a cast and then your calculator does do infinity. And then mean is 5 and standard deviation is 2. Let's go ahead and put that in our calculator. And to, on the calculator, let me just remind you how to get that. We're going to be using normal CDF. To get to any of the distributions page is menu, stat, distribution. And that will get you to your normal CDF, to your inverse norm, to any distribution we're doing. So I went ahead and did it on here, but I'll show you. And I go menu, stat, distribution, normal CDF. 
My lower bound, we said, was six because I want movies that were gr greater than six, right? I believe that's what it was. Just double checking. Yes. <clears throat> my upper bound is infinity. And my mean was five. And my standard deviation is two. And that comes out to 0 0.3085. So this is here. This is going to be 0 0.3085. So I need to make sure I write it in context. So I say about 31% of, who am I talking about? Students at the Fine Art Academy of students at the Fine Art Academy watch more than six movies per semester. Okay, so I have to make sure I have it in context. All right, I want to pause here and let you guys do these here. You guys can do number two and three because they're identical. This one is just going to have between three and eight. And you're looking for this percentage. Okay, go ahead and write the probability statement and the normal CDF. And then go ahead and do this one here, which is less than two movies per semester. All right, so the probability statement for this one would be the probability that 3 is less than or equal to, because it says between x and here. Uh, yeah, you could interpret that as 3 and 8 were not included, and that would not penalize you. Um, it's negligible of having it equal to and not equal to on the normal model and a continuous model, so we don't worry about this, the equal to or less than equal to signs necessarily. So this is going to be 3 minus, so I'm doing the same thing. 3 minus 5 over 2, so just like we did up here, is less than or equal to z, less than or equal to 8 minus 5 over 2. And that's equal to, I'm just going to leave the blank and go to normal CDF. Lower bound is going to be 3. Upper bound is going to be 8. And the mean is going to be 5. And the innovation is going to be 2. And yes, absolutely, you must put, you must label these. You can't just put normal CDF without lower bound, upper bound, means innovation labels. All right, and then I go over here, and you can kind of, um, if you already have it in here, you can just change these numbers and go over here, and my lower bound and upper bound were 3 and 8, so you could do that, or you could go ahead and do the same thing that I did before. Uh, if I can find my comma on here, here we go, 3 and 8, there we go. And then that's going to be about 77.5%, so 0.775. So then I'm going to write the same thing, but here is going to be 77.5%. So about 77.5% of students at the Fine Art Academy watch between three and eight movies per semester. Okay, for the next one, this probability is x is less than 2, which the probability is z is less than 2 minus 5 over 2. And that, I'm going to leave blank, normal CDF, lower bound, negative infinity, or negative 9999 on your calculator. Upper bound is going to be 2, mean is going to be 5, and standard deviation is going to be 2. Uh, going to do the same thing in my calculator. I went ahead and put it in my calculator. It's up here at 0 .067, 0 0.067. You're going to write the same thing about 6.7% of Fine Art Academies are going to be um, between, oh, less than two movies per semester. Okay, this one here is a little bit different because it's giving me my percentage. And I know I'm at 15%. Well, I know that 3 is at 16%. Why do I know that? Because it's at one standard deviation and 68 is in between. So I know that 15% is going to be somewhere a little bit. I'm going to put Y because I don't know. We know that's 15%. Because it says the bottom 15%. So I want to know what that value is, and I don't know what it is. So I'm going to write the probability of the statement the same way. The probability that x is less than y is equal to the probability that 
z is less than y minus 5 over 2. And this time, I do know that this is 0.15. We are looking for y. So now, not normal CDF, we're going to go to inverse norm. And inverse norm is going to bring up your area. And the area, if you recall, is always the left to the right. So everything starts at the left and stops at the right. So you need your area and your mean and your standard deviation. So the mean and standard deviation we know are 5 and 2. The area that I'm looking for is this area right here. So I just put 0.15. Okay, let's go ahead and do it on the calculator. So you go menu, same thing, stats, distribution, and this is now inverse norm. My area is 0.15, my mean is 5, and my standard deviation is 2. And I hit OK. And that tells me the value at 2.93. So that's going to be 2.93. And so I say about 2.93 fine arts students watch um, 15% or less movies. Okay. All right, let's go to this next example. This next example actually gives you the answer. The question is I want you to be able to um, come up with the answer. So um, I'm going to kind of, you have the answer on your page, but I'm just going to kind of Take it off of my page just so I can teach. All right, test A has a mean of 79 and a standard deviation of 3. Test B has a mean of 84 and a standard deviation of 5. Rudy made an 83 on the test and a 90 on test B. Which one did he do better? Well, this gives you the Z scores, which is what you're going to need. But I want you to find the Z scores because you have to show your work. So the way you would do that, Z score of A is going to be observed, which is he got a 90 on it. No, he didn't. He got an 83 on it. Minus the mean of his test was 79, and a standard deviation was 3. Remember, observed minus mean divided by standard deviation. That's always my z-score. And you look down here, and I got 1.33. And the z-score of B is going to be he got a 90 on test B, so he did better on test B. However, according to the rest of the class, the rest of the class got an 84 divided by a standard deviation of 5. He got a 1.2. So even though he did better numerically on the test on test B, comparatively speaking to the class, he did better on test A because it has a higher Z-score because that means that I'm above more people than I am on this one. Okay, so um, this one says, oh, this is talking about the Z-score as far as the chart. I don't really use the chart very much. I, if some of you guys are still using the chart, that's fine. But if you use it, make sure you are able to do this. Okay, I stopped here for the rest of my class, um, and tomorrow we're going to be doing bivariate data. So what I would like you guys to actually start doing right now is flip down here to the multiple choice. And there's 30 multiple choice, so we're going to go ahead and start some of them. So I'd like you guys to go ahead and use the rest of your time, there we go, to do um, these multiple choice. And I'd like you guys to get through 15 total. So you should be able to, or let's not do 15, let's do 12. Yeah, let's do 12. Okay, so let's do 12 total. And the rest of them we should be able to finish tomorrow in class. If not, I'll give you them to finish up. So if you want to finish them, obviously you can do them. Um, all right, let's quickly talk about the 2002 AP test of what I expect. All right, so the 2002 AP test, so you guys are going to do 12 right now. Like you stop, stop the thing and do 12 and then what you don't finish you can do for homework. All right. So let me talk about this real fast. So um, the 2002 AP test, what I expect. So to 2002 AP test. So far, you should have already completed and uploaded it. Just done raw. Okay, what you're going to do week one, this was week one. So what you're going to do week two, week two do, I think it's the fifth is that day. Let me just double check. Yes, so do Monday the fifth. All right, you're going to, to grade and correct your FRQs. All right, so with a different color. 
And I want it to be, I know you're going to be looking at the publisher. I don't want the publisher's words per se, because sometimes, but sometimes you're going to have to use the publisher's words. That's fine. But I just want a really good understanding, a really good understanding, good explanation in a different color. The reason I'm doing the multiple choice week three is because it takes a lot longer than the free response. And my thought is, do the free response, take a day or two to do the free response, and start the multiple choice, because this takes a long time if you do it right. And if you don't do it right, you won't get full credit. So I wanted to talk about it. So for the multiple choice, so this is multiple choice, and this is FRQ. So for the multiple choice, I need you to do every single problem. So you've got 40 of them. So for number one, I'm going to kind of go over it with you and show you what you need to do. Number one, it says, which of the following is a key distinction between a well-designed experiment and an observational study? Okay. So A says, more subjects are available for experiments than observational studies. And you would say, um, and you would just explain that's false. And why is that false? Because um, equal number of subjects would be available. So you're telling me why this is false. Part B. Ethical constraints prevent large-scale observational studies, and you would say false, and you would say if the study is done well, ethical issues should not arise. Or you could even say, hey, ethical issues could arise equally in an experiment or in an observational study. Um, there's inappropriate things you can do in observational studies that would um, be unethical as well as experiment or observational studies and experiment. So anyway, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, you're going to go through all of that A, B, C, D, E and do that. Now, on all of them, it doesn't necessarily have to go through all A, B, C, D and E because some of them, like for instance, for number two, it asks you um, your hypothesis. And so let's just jump to number two and show you. So this one is saying a manufacturer of balloons that have P proportion of its balloons that burst inflated diameter of up to 12 inches. There's no more than 0.05, da, 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 da. And it says, which of the following hypotheses would be appropriate? So you're going to say, like for A, it says, ho is P is not equal to 0.05, and ha is P is equal to 0.05. And, you know, you have your different ones here. Well, for this one, I would, I don't need you to say, well, the re on this one, you would say, okay, very easy. Why this one is wrong is because we always start with a ho, it has an equal sign. Just simple like that, right? So I want you to kind of look and be like, ooh, this is why I knew immediately this one was wrong. Some of them, though, are just so extraneous, you can just say that, all right? But that's kind of what I want you to do, and that's why it takes so long, because I want you to do that on all 40 problems as if you're teaching it, and someone's looking at a really good answer key trying to figure out the problems, all right? And um, yes, you can work with people. You can work with a group. I encourage it. It's fine. And, and if you get stuck, you can work with me. If you say, hey, you've looked through these. You don't know. I don't know number three, number five, and number seven or something. Um, I can go over them with you and kind of teach you the concept, so then you can write up the concept. All right. I hope that clears up anything. And then um, you guys have a good day. And then I will see you guys tomorrow. All right. Thank you very much.